Why does this American M1 Abrams have Canadian flag markings on it? We'll be going over that and more at 11. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M1 Abrams main battle tank. The model in this video is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these smaller scale build videos, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built predominantly out of the box, however, I went ahead and upgraded the model in a few certain key areas. We'll be going over all these modifications and additions in this video, not to mention we'll also be going ahead and taking the model, doing a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of info flying right at you. To start this video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the ubiquitous M1 Abrams main battle tank. More specifically, this is the original version of the M1 what, that was adopted by the U.S. Army in the early 1980s. As many people will tell you, the M1 Abrams main battle tank family is one of the most powerful as well as one of the most successful main battle tanks that is currently being fielded today. However, what a lot of people don't realize is that this vehicle platform itself is actually pretty old. The vehicle itself was adopted in the early 1980s, but the design itself actually goes a little bit earlier to the late 60s as well as during the 1970s. The M1 Abrams was built upon lessons that was learned from the earlier MBT-70 program that was being designed during the late portion of the 1960s in order to replace the M60 main battle tank. The MBT-70 itself was a very interesting vehicle in its own right and also brought a lot of new concepts and technologies to the table that were previously not really explored. The problem with the MBT-70, however, is that a lot of these technologies proved to be just not fully fleshed out, specifically with the technology of the era, and also because of this, the vehicle's costs just skyrocketed through the roof. At a certain point, the US Congress intervened and canceled the project. However, although the MBT-70 was a failure, many of the design concepts that were learned during this program went on to influence both the US tank designers as well as the tank designers from West Germany. In the United States, the designers over at Chrysler Defense took a lot of these lessons learned and incorporated them into their new tank design, which after a little bit of research and development, wound up being the XM1. The vehicle went through extensive research and development throughout the 1970s, where many modification improvements were made to the design. Finally, in 1980, the vehicle was ready for adoption, where the US Army finally adopted it and designated the M1 Abrams. Of course, the vehicle's namesake is none other than Creighton Abrams, who was a legendary commander during World War II and after the war served on into the US military, winding up being a high-ranking officer. During the 1970s time frame, Mr. Abrams passed away, so in honor of his service, the US military decided to name this new tank after him. The M1 Abrams was vastly different compared to the legacy vehicles that came before it, where the M60 family was really nothing more than a product improved version of other vehicles that date back all the way to the M26 Persian family, the M1 was a complete departure from that. For the armor protection, rather than utilizing single piece cast components for the hull and the turret like we've seen on the M60 in the patents, the M1 was to utilize flat steel type construction. However, rather than it being just pure steel, the vehicle utilized a composite armor type system. This system is called Chobham Armor, which was developed in the UK during the late 60s, early 70s time frame. This new armor type design proved to be very effective in defeating heat projectiles as well as other armor piercing type projectiles which were widely being used in conflicts at that time. Another humongous departure was with the vehicle's engine and power pack. Rather than a standard turbo diesel engine like what was seen on the legacy vehicles, the M1 was to utilize a gas turbine jet engine. This engine gave fantastic power weight ratio and was able to propel the vehicle at blistering speeds that would have left the other previous vehicles really in the dust. The vehicle survivability was also vastly improved by having the ammunition separate from the fighting compartment. 
on the M1 Abrams, the crew compartment was isolated from the ammunition magazine via a blast door and a blast bulkhead. The way the system worked is that when the ammunition was needed, a door would open up, the loader would grab the shell and be able to load it into the gun. When not in use, a blast door would seal off the compartments from each other. Why this is important is that if the vehicle gets hit, the ammunition in the magazines will detonate. However, rather than destroying the entire vehicle, the vehicle had special blast doors on the roof that would blow out and the explosion would vent harmlessly into the atmosphere. For the vehicle's main gun, the Abrams utilized the then standard L7-105. This was basically the de facto main tank gun used by NATO of the period and was used by other American vehicles such as the M60A1 as well as the then aging M48A5. For secondary armament, the Army moved away from the M85 and the M73 for reasons that were pretty glaring at the period. Instead, for the 50 caliber, the M1 used the tried and true M2HB, only this gun was fitted to its own independent cupola and it was able to be fired from inside of the vehicle. For the other machine guns, the Army went with the FN mag, which then they adopted and designated it as the M240. When the M1 finally was adopted and issued to the troops for the first time, it was met with some mixed results. Some individuals absolutely loved it. They thought this thing was a brand new sports car compared to the older vehicles that they were using. While others, including military analysts, thought that the vehicle was too radically new with too much new unproven technology and was possibly going to be a problem. During the late 1980s, the vehicle finally entered into the Canadian Armor Trials, which was a competition held in Canada where the Western NATO forces would send their tanks as well as their crews to compete in a field of fire event. At this event, the M1 faced off against the German Leopard 2 as well as the British Challenger Mark 1, and at the end of the competition, the M1 was the winner. Although the CAD competitions did prove the viability of the M1, it wasn't until the first Gulf War in 1990 was when the naysayer military analysts were finally put in their place and were forever silenced on the viability of this vehicle. As the decades rolled on, the vehicle would constantly be upgraded to keep it up with current specs and technology. Things like a new main gun, new electronics would be fitted to the vehicle, the armor protection would be improved on later versions, and other smaller modifications were made as well, such as a change in the track design and even other storage equipment racks found on the turret. However, at the end of the day, the, the current version of the M1 can still basically trace its lineage back to this original pattern that we have here. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this vintage Eshi slash Ertl M1 Abrams. For anyone who's a frequent viewer of the channel, this is not the first time I've tackled an Eshi kit. I've done several of their builds in the past in both 135th scale and in 172nd scale. When it comes to the M1 Abrams, this model here, like the other Eshi kits, was developed by Eshi in the mid-1980s. Like I stated in those other videos, Eshi is an Italian-based plastic model company that started in the mid-1970s and finally went out of business somewhere in the early to mid-1990s time frame. During this time, they released a wide range of kits, but specifically with their armor kits, they worked in two scales, 172nd and 135. Although by today's standards, their kits may be considered on the more simplistic end, back during the era where these kits were being manufactured and produced, they were actually some of the best detail kits that were available at that time. And in many cases, their kits still hold up to today. This kit here is really nothing more than a scaled up version of their 172nd scale M1 kit that was released around the same period as this fellow here. This is definitely going to be appreciated when I crack the box open and you're going to get to see not only the quality of the details but also with the way the kit contents are strewn out on the runners and even how they are just molded. It's very reminiscent to their 172nd scale counterpart. Another interesting fact to point out about the Eshi kits was that they never left the modern time frame in terms of the type of kits that they produced for armor. In 172nd scale, they did several vehicles in, from the World War II time frame, but for the 135th scale lineup, they primarily stayed with 
at the time, what was considered to be modern armor, such vehicles as the M1, the M60, as well as their T55, are some of the kits that come to mind. These kits here were designed in 1988, which at this period, the M1 Abrams was really brand new equipment and was the cutting edge technology that the Army had at this period. Although around 1988 time frame, you start to see the transition from the M1 to the M1A1, where they swapped out the main gun as well as a few other odds and ends, but that's really more or less something to talk about in another video. While on that note, Eshi also tooled up an M1A1 variant of this kit as well, which basically supplies you with majority of the exact same kit parts, but they supply you an extra runner or two to make the model with the A1 configuration. In addition to doing it in 135th scale, they did the exact same thing on their 172nd scale kit counterpart as well. Shortly after Eshi closed up shop, its tooling and molds were sold off to other plastic model companies that were on the market. One of the companies that acquired a large number of the previous Eshi kits was Italeri. Now, I am unsure if Italeri got the molds for this particular kit. I do know that in probably late 90s or in the early 2000s, Italeri did release an M1 kit in 135th scale, but I am unsure if it was utilizing the old Eshi tooling or if it was something of their own creation. Back to this kit here, this particular kit with this rendition of its box art is its original release by Eshi back in 1988. During this time frame, all of the Eshi 135th scale kits followed this type of format with both the typography as well as its color scheme on the box. Over the years, when this kit here would be re-released, the box art would also change a handful of times. In addition to the box art changing, so would the logo badge found on the corner. Rather than the Eshi brand name being prominent, you would see the AMT logo in the same exact location. With the change of the logo, the typography would change as well to better match the other military kits which were being sold by the AMT brand name of the period. During the period when these kits were produced, they were produced in good quantities. And even today, they are still relatively simplistic to track down. This particular model here I acquired off of eBay about a month or two ago, so it hasn't been sitting in the shop for very long. When these models are found, they are also still fairly affordable. These kits go anywhere between 15 to about 30 US dollars, as well as anywhere else in between. Starting with the model's box art, here we have the vehicle slightly off center in this type of format, which is what I call the champagne box art, where we have a illustration of the tank, a white box with the name of the vehicle connected to the white box, and then for the surrounding color, we have this gold champagne type coloring. When it comes to the illustration itself, it's actually pretty good, as are several of the other Eshi box arts of this era. This was, I believe, the vehicle that may want, have won the competition, which was the one here with Garfield riding on top of the tank round. Moving along to the remainder of the box, takes to the Eshi logo, adorning the Ertl logo, which is directly below it. And this is jumping a little bit ahead, but just like with the other kits, of the era that were made by Eshi. This kit here utilizes the cancerous link and lane track, which if anyone is a frequent viewer of my channel, you will know exactly how much disdain I have for this particular feature, but I'll touch upon that once I crack the box open. Moving from the box art takes to the remainder of the graphic design, and just like all other Eshi kits of the period, they utilize red banners for the side graphics. Here on the corner, we have another thumbnail of the tank, as well as the kit, which is 5020. The vehicle name, the scale, as well as the logo. Some other important information on the opposite side, UPC. Some more info, <laughs> and you could see some prices that this kit retailed with for a period of time. And interestingly enough, it looked like at some point, this kit here was purchased from Germany. So that's kind of cool. And on this side here, we have some more information as well as the dreaded Lincoln Length logo. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and crack the box open. Now, as you can hear, this kit is not an original tree configuration, but from what I was able to ascertain from cracking it open earlier, it seems that all the contents are there. So without further ado, let's crack it open. First thing I want to point out that just like the other Eshi kits of the period, 
Every single part on this kit here is made from injection molded plastic. So you're not going to find any sort of photo etch or brass or turned barrels or anything like that found on this kit. This is as old school as you can possibly get. Okay, starting with the parts, they are molded in this olive green coloring, which is typical for armor kits of the period, and of course, even till today. And here we have the tooling quality found on the top deck. Now, as you can see, the tooling quality, despite being 30-something years old, is remarkably well made. All the lines are nice and crisp. You even have some decent weld beads found in these sections over here. And note the detailing found here on the engine grills. Very impressive for the era. Also, I want to point out that the same type of quality of detailing was found on the 172nd scale kit that I recently completed a few months back. And I have a video on YouTube of that build as well. Setting that aside, this is to the turret. Again, some pretty good quality. I like the well beads, how they're etched, and also you can see here that they did the appropriate geometry of the Abrams turret, where on the first front portion sections here, they are straight plates, but on this portion it's actually curved and rounded because it's actually one plate that they bend and then they weld it up on these sections over here. And that is found on the Eshi tooling. Here we have the commander's cupola. It's got molded in periscopes, which is you know quite standard. Here we have the conduit detailing, all present on this kit. We're going to wait to the lower pan. Note you can see that the turret is asymmetrical, which would be appropriate for a first generation M1 Abrams. And I believe there might be some detailing found on the bottom plate here, but a little hazy on that. But again, what you see is what you get on this kit. Put that aside. Moving further, it takes us to this runner here, which consists of just a crab bag of parts consisting for the lower hull as well as even the turret. Here we have the rear plate. A little bit on the simplistic end, like you don't have, for instance, the little fasteners that are found on this plate over here and on this mud flap it would be a little row and the exhaust vent is again simplistic does the job but eh, could be a little bit better and for what we expect on current tooling something like this like would people would definitely turn their noses up so there we have the tail lights again basically this kit here is nothing more than the 170 second scale one just blown up to 135 we have the short bins because this is an early pattern M1. Rear plate, it does have little footman loops or tie downs found on it. Again, the focus, they are, they are finely molded. Here we have the mantlet. All in all, basically everything you need to assemble the kit. And here we have the smoke grenade launchers. And note they are in their loaded configuration. Which is pretty interesting because generally when you see these kits, these are always in their empty configurations where you just have the holes present. But it's not the case here on the old Eshi. Moving down further takes us to the lower hull. Now if anyone has ever watched my 172nd scale Eshi M1 build video, these parts here should look very familiar because they are literally identical on the other kit. Here we have the two side panels which are used to assemble the mosaic hull. And these side panels have their torsion bar detailing found. And the torsion bars are integrally molded along with the axles for the road wheels. And that also includes the axle here for the main drive sprocket. Stuff like this you don't really see on contemporary 135th scale kits. So interesting that they went with this type of format. And of course the opposite side is just a mirror image. Lower hull. Very simple. They did add these two axis hatches here, which is a nice touch. And it does have the little toe points found on the front portion of the lower hull. Of course, they are not drilled out, but, you know, that's something that can easily be tackled with a pin vise. Digging down deeper takes to the side skirts. Note they are a single piece assembly, which is quite commonplace on M1 kits that are on the market in, in many scales. 
Note that this is the early rendition of the M1 with the rear panel here on the side skirt. This would be revised and changed shortly after this pattern was adopted. The revised pattern, as we all know, comes out straight and then curves and bends downward, revealing more of the drive sprocket. On the front here, we have the little step ladders that are found on the front section of the side skirt panel, and on the real vehicle, these would actually be made from a steel cable. Going down deeper takes this runner, which is the last of the tar components. Here we have the gypsy racks, which are an early M1 pattern. Note they are broken on these two rails here, and attention is going to have to be exhibited by me during actual assembly. Here we have the 105 millimeter gun. It's a two half barrel assembly, which is quite commonplace for plastic tank kits. And here we have the single plate, which is for the blowout panels, or as my former boss used to call them, the million dollar blowouts. Digging down further takes us to this runner, which is the running gear. You can see the quality of detailing found on the road wheels. It would be considered quite dated for today's quality, but these wheels are more than capable enough for assembling a decent rendition of the M1's wheels in my opinion. Note they do have the appropriate hubcap detailing found in this section over here, although on the real tank these are actually made from clear plastic, but I'll touch upon that once the vehicle is fully assembled. Continuation of the runner, same exact tooling for the wheels, and here we have the sprockets. Sprockets are pretty basic, they do not have their mud slits found in them, which is quite commonplace actually. And here we have the sprocket ring re-railer, which is a iconic bit of detailing found on these early pattern M1 Abrams vehicles. And it's actually one of my favorite bits of detailing on this pattern of tank. And we even have here some return rollers, which is another nice bit of detailing. And I think this was absent on the Tamiya kit, if I'm not mistaken, of the era. But anyway, you can see the detailing found them where they actually have their little holes that are found in them. On the real vehicle, these would be th drilled throughout, and more than likely I'll be doing that procedure to these two. But again, more on that is to come. Thinking down further, we just have some more odds and ends from bits and pieces that have fallen off runners, like this section over here which is unclear to me, but of course I'll figure that out. This here is the sensor for the main gun. It goes on the rear of the turret. I believe it's a wind sensor, if I'm not mistaken. Hopefully some vet isn't going to be pounding that keyboard in all caps trying to correct me on that. Here we have the commander's cupola hatch. The muzzle end of the 105 and some more roll wheels as well as the sprocket. I went ahead and did a head count of the roll wheel parts see if I was short any, and that doesn't seem to be the case. I have everything I need to assemble this kit in this box. And that now brings us this demon that we have here, this runner of parts. You see, just like with the other Eshi tank kits of the era, this kit utilizes individual static link and link tracks for the track assemblies. Interestingly enough, it's probably because of Eshi why us armor modelers were doomed and forsaken throughout the desolate wasteland, which was known as the 1990s. You see, Eshi was really one of the first companies to utilize this type of format for track assemblies. Of course, before the release of these kits, if anyone was releasing or producing a small-scale plastic tank kit, for the tracks they would be facilitated by two bands of a flexible type material. And by all cases, these tracks are pretty good. You know, they're easy to paint, they're easy to assemble, they go on very quickly, and they do have some pretty good detailing on them. However, they do have some faults. The first fault is with the type of material that they are molded in. A lot of times the material is pretty stiff, and because of that, the track might have issues going around sprockets, or keeping a proper track tension. Other problems that the, that that type of track has is actually with cost. You see, if you're developing a plastic kit and you're spending money on tooling, so because of which, you now need to have two types of machines and equipment to produce a single kit. 
With this type of a format, you don't need that. You just make the one mold and you could crank out a hundred of these things without really having an impact on your final budget. Another advantage that this type of layout had was that polystyrene at the time allowed you to have better finely molded details compared to a flexible counterpart. So this was why with all these so-called advantages, why companies started going with this type of format for tracks during the decade that came after these kits here. And for example, we have kits like Dragon, Italeri, Tamiya, even Academy, everybody in the 1990s time frame were going with this pattern of track and it sucked because these tracks here literally suck. They are impossible to put together and put together well. I, I know I'm going to be flooded with people saying, oh, but this guy has a tutorial and there's this tutorial. I don't care what tutorials you have out there. I don't care. I, I, I don't care what anyone says either. These tracks are trash. They don't go together very well at all and they stick out like a sore thumb. If you only knew how many nice kit builds I've seen utterly ruined because of these junk tracks. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at these tracks that I'm definitely not using on this build. So you can see the detailing found on the surface. Note that they are the early pattern of M1 Abrams track with the chevron type layout. This of course would be changed as the M1 would progress where they would develop the single flat pad Bigfoot pattern track, which is non-directional. And on the inside here, we do have some decent track detailing, namely the skeletal structure, which is below the rubber pads, the inner track pad, as well as the guide horns. Note that the inner pads do have some knockout marks. I'm pretty sure some people would put this as a ding on the kit. But then again, it makes no difference for me because I'm not using them. In their place, I'm going to swap them out with these tracks here are from Trumpeter and were developed in the mid-2000s time frame. And really it's because of technologies like this and better technologies in molding and casting flexible type materials, which is why, thankfully, individual Lincoln Link tracks are on their way out and have been for a number of years now. Although it's still really annoying to see modern tooling kits release vehicles with this pattern track. <coughs> track on. <coughs> mm. Anyway, uh, back to these tracks over here. Opening this box reveals the kit contents. This is like a mini review in a review. And here we have the tracks here. Note that these are the same directional chevron type pattern of tracks that were found on the kit original. And these tracks are going to be required for an early pattern M1. If I put current design tracks on this type of tank, it's going to be anachronistic and inaccurate. With the bag open up, you can see what the tracks look like. And now you can get a better view of the track pads. They are also much better in their representation compared to the ones found on the Eshi molded links. Note they have their guide horns, which are separately molded, which is a nice touch. And here we have the end connectors that are molded as well. I have assembled tracks from Trumpeter before on a few builds I've done a number of years ago, and those tracks went together without any hitch, so I'm not exactly anticipating any hiccups with these ones here. These tracks are also fairly affordable. I got these off of eBay for, I believe, 15 bucks. It is something you do have to consider when working on one of these kits that have Lincoln Link tracks. If you're gonna go for a workable track offering, anticipate you're going to be spending probably the same price of a lower end kit on them just in order to correct the crappy tracks that are supplied with the kit. But this is something that needs to be factored in. Also, there are a ton of other track options on the market. The plastic links here are more on the affordable end. Some of the more higher price options would be links made from metal, and there are a few other manufacturers out there from Fruly to Master Club, and it really depends on your budget the pattern of track, because some track types are not offered by other manufacturers, as well as what you're used to working with. Metal tracks do require a slightly different skill set compared to these tracks here, which are just standard ABS type plastic. And to compare and contrast here, we have the Eshi links in contrast to the trumpeter ones. Note that they are basically the exact same size and width, which is extremely important because they need to time on the Eshi sprockets, and if there is a 
dimension difference, this can cause issues when it comes time for looping them around. But hopefully, I'm not seeing anything that which would allude to there being any problems. So we're gonna find out, of course, as the build goes on. Back to the SEM1. This little envelope over here has a little ammo can in it, as well as the set of decals. Finally, this takes to the instruction sheet. Nothing really much to talk about or write home about. It's pretty basic, what you would expect to assemble a kit from this era. And just like with the other kits from the era, there's no fancy schmancy CAD drawings found. Everything is all done via old school drafting techniques. And here's the model at the tail end of its construction. Shortly after filming of this scene, it'll head off into paint and final completion. The model itself was a pretty simplistic build. There's not really a whole lot going on here. And since the model is built predominantly out of the box, like I said before, again, it just goes together fairly quickly. You could see some of the body work areas in red. This was done to help the model fit together better. And this is basically standard on plastic model kits in general, specifically ones from this era. It's not just found on the front, but also right here on the rear section. And again, this type of fitting is what we all come to expect on again from models from this vintage. There were some sinkholes, or I should say injection pin marks, not so much sinkholes, but these were just, again, just puttied over and just sanded away smooth. While the model's in this condition here, it gives you a good idea to see some of the mods that have been made. Right here on the mantlet, there's this little tab. This little tab is present with the kit. However, it's super rudimentary in its overall shape and detailing. And so rather than using the kit one, I just fabricated a new replacement. The piece was made from a, a little section of Plastruct strip. It was bent to have the appropriate geometry to it. If you can see it, you'll notice that it's not just straight, it actually has a little bit of a slope and a incline to it. And then I also drilled the two small little holes that are found in the top portion right here. On the back side of the gypsy rack, one of the pieces of the rail were broken and were missing, so I just fabricated a new one out of a little strip of, or I should say a little section of metal floor wire. Of course, the floor wire is the same diameter as the rest of the gypsy cage, so it just blends right in. And since it's broken right here at the, at the frame, it's a nice seamless transition between the two materials. Finally here, right on the back, we have two antenna bases. Now these are my own resin castings. I made a copy of the Tamiya M60A1 antenna base a little while ago, just so I could use it on the various builds that I have here in the shop. The kit one was very simplistic in its overall detailing. This side here didn't even have an antenna base present. It was just a a detailless plate, while on this side here there was a small little, I guess a cone of sorts to try to mimic as much as possible the antenna base bottom, but rather than trying to salvage that, I just simply replace it entirely with my cast resin ones. This will be much more noticeable and appreciated once the model is fully painted, which of course you'll be seeing soon enough. Finally, one more modification I am gonna make has to do with the taillights. You see here we have the kit molded in taillights and they were okay out of the box. Unfortunately, throughout the build, it must have had some kind of a snafu because this side here, the casing was cracked. So more than likely, I guess during the build, I must have dropped it of some sort or another, landed on this portion here and chipped it. Regrettably, because of that, I can't keep this. I'm gonna have to replace it. And since I have to replace one, for continuity's sake, I have to replace both of them. Now, to replace the taillights, I had to crack into the stash to find a good donor kit to borrow the taillights from. And what I mean by borrow is just that. I'm not jacking the parts from that other kit. I'm simply using them to make a mold of them so that I could make resin castings. The original parts were then resealed up back into the original packaging after the mold work was concluded. And the kit that I borrowed the taillights from was the 135th scale Dragon M1A2 Abrams kit. This kit, of course, will be the subject matter of an upcoming video, but until then, here you can see the resin castings that were made. Note that the pieces, unlike the original Ashley kit, are comprised of two sections. We have the rear taillight and the housing. The rear taillight detailing as well as the housing details are far more improved compared to the original ones found on the older tooling Eshi kit. Now like I said before, the Eshi kit ones are relatively okay. In fact, I would normally not have to go through this problem if this little bugger over here didn't crack off, but fortunately this is the path that we're on now. The 
like I said before, the tail light is nicely detailed and the well. If you notice on the well here, there's that little cutout in this section over here, which is present on the tail light guard found on the M1 Abrams tank family. In order to mount those ones, however, the old ones here are going to have to be amputated and deleted away. Of course, this will be done with a Dremel with a high speed cutting bit and hopefully speaking, the amount of bodywork that's going to be required to square off these sections here shouldn't be too egregious. Another bit of detailing that was reworked from the kit original were the kit sprockets. These two started off as the stock sprockets that were showcased earlier on in the unboxing portion of this video. In order to modify them, you can see that the mud slits have been added to the outer casing. Now, what's unique to point out that the mud slits are a bit of detailing that is missed on just about all of the 135th scale M1s that are on the market. From Tamiya to Dragon to even Trumpeter, all of the mentioned kits use the same type of, or I should say the similar type of tooling found on these old Ashy ones where the sprocket drum is just one solid kit molding. This is also the case for the other vehicles that would have this type of detailing, namely the M48 and the M60. Although, like I mentioned in those videos, you can get by by leaving them stock without adding the mud slits, but on the Abrams, that's not the case. You see, on the M60, there are several examples of some subcontractors who were making these components for the US government, and they just didn't, for one reason or another, add the mud slits to their castings. On the Abrams, however, that doesn't seem to be the case. All M1 Abrams that I've seen, either on the internet or even in person, all feature the mud slits found on the sprocket hubs. Of course, if I am mistaken with this, and if anyone knows for certain that this is not necessarily the case, feel free to put that in the comment section listed below, along with a link, because I would be really interested to know if that's the case with the M1 as well. However, back to the sprockets at hand, the mud slits found on the Abrams are very different compared to the ones found on the Legacy vehicles. Those ones utilize three oval slits that ran vertically along the drum. On the Abrams, the design was very different. The Abrams utilize four of these larger holes, and if you notice, they have this strange shape to them where they kind of look like an open cartoon mouth, I should say. It's not really a half moon, it's... It's its own animal, really. And this seems to be the the shape found on all the M1s that I've been researching from all throughout the eras, from when the tank was first adopted all the way up even through today. The slits were all done via a Dremel with a router bit and were done primarily freehand. I did draw out the parameters of the hole so I don't make them too large or too small depending on the ones I was doing at any given time, but overall they came out pretty well, and you can see how much they changed the overall look and appearance of the stock sprocket. It's a great way to improve the look of your stock kit that just has the piece molded solid. And it's also important to point out because on the Abrams, the rear mounted sprocket really is a detailed focal point found on this pattern of vehicle. And while on the topic of focal points, that takes us to the aligner rank. One of the most iconic bits of detailing found on the original M1 Abrams was this little bit of equipment here. The Abrams, the originally was designed to go much faster than the vehicle that we know today. And one of the design features that it had was this ring that was fastened to the, to the tooth rings. It's basically just sandwiched together with the mounting fasteners. And the point of this piece is to prevent the track from derailing or throwing due to the sheer speed that the tank would be traveling at. This feature was typically found on early pattern vehicles. However, there are a few pictures floating around of, I believe one was a Marine Corps M1A1 or A2 Abrams taken probably in the mid 2000s. And it featured this bit of equipment still on it. So... I don't want to say they're totally phased out, but by, by and large, these pieces here are a thing of the past. However, there might be an oddity floating around that might have these pieces still fastened on. Regardless, the components that you see on this model here are not the ones supplied with the kit. The, the different color plastic should cue you in on that. The kit does supply you with these components, as we can recall, and they can be found here on the runner. Now, the kit supply component on any other day would be utilized on this kit without any problems. They do have the correct shape, geometry, and the whole pattern is where it needs to be for the early M1 railer. But instead of using the kit ones, I swapped them out with a pair of units that we have here. These ones were sitting in my spare parts bin. I, oddly enough, found them the other day and originally for, were from a Trumpeter M1 Abrams 
kit that I did a number of years ago. And they've been sitting in the stash, ooh, I'd say ever since 2003 or so. So it's been a while. These components here are basically identical to the ones found on the Eshi kit, but the reason why they were used in place was because of the surface detailing. You'll notice here that on the trumpeter one, the bolt detailing, if you get it to focus, is found on the surface of the re-railer, while on the Eshi kit, they are fastenerless. Because I had these ones on hand and they do have the better detailing and it was just a simple swap out replacement, you know, it's one of those things, well, why not? So these ones were used and the Eshi ones are now going to be relegated to the spare bin for who knows how long. And while on the same runner, you can see that on the return rollers, I went ahead and drilled out the holes found on these pieces here with a pin vise. The holes are integrally molded onto the wheels, but they're not drilled out all the way. So with a simple pin vise, I went ahead and, and just finished off the procedure. Why I'm showing this now is because once the tank is fully painted and finished, you're not going to see these bits of detailing because the side skirts really cover everything up. So it's one of those details where it's not seen, but it really didn't hurt the build at all by just adding the holes. Starting with the model suspension, the components that you see here outside of the track and the re-railer ring are left completely stock. The stock model does go together pretty quickly and easily in that regard. Because the swing arms and the torsion bars pieces are integrally molded to the side of the hull, you don't have to worry about the pieces being independently molded where you have to line them up appropriately to make sure that everything is at the even height. One small ding, however, that this kit has, and it's not alone in this regard, is that underneath the side skirts over here is absent of any sort of the inner brace detailing which is present on the real M1 Abrams. If you've ever seen a real M1 and looked underneath the skirts you'll see a ton of arms and other appendages emerging from the side of the hull in order to support the side skirts here. This omission is common and is basically seen on just about all of the 135th scale M1s that I've ever worked on from Tamiya, Trumpeter and I believe even Dragon as well. However, if you're building your tank stock out of the box with all of the side skirts present, it's not really that much of an issue. But it is something that I do want to bring up. While on the row wheels, one painting tip I do want to point out involves the hubcaps. You see, the hubcaps on the M1 Abrams are unique because they are molded in clear plastic. The reason why this material is used is so that the maintenance crews can visually see exactly how much lubricant and oil are on the inside portions where the bearings are. On the majority of plastic 135th scale M1 kits and even 116 scale kits on the market, these hubcaps are rendered in standard opaque plastic. In order to enhance the detailing on your build, all you got to do is after you're done building and painting your model with some gloss black paint, just paint the hubcaps with this material. This will give the illusion that the hubcaps are made out of clear plastic and that the vehicle has the proper amount of oil found in these recesses. It's a really simple addition to make and once done it really makes your model stick out compared to just having everything oversprayed with the standard base coat or the camouflage. Moving backward takes us to the sprocket and here you can see the modified sprocket now that it's fully painted and weathered. Obviously those little additions that I made to it before really enhance it compared to the stock original offering. Of course, the re-railer ring was a luxury item that I just so happened to have on hand. However, if I was still building the model out of the box, the stock unit would have been suffice. However, the mud slit holes would have been another modification that I still would have added. From the sprocket, this logically now takes us to the track. And obviously, this is one of the bigger modifications and changes that I made to this build from the kit original. There was no way in hell I was going to utilize those individual Lincoln Lane tracks, and they were promptly tossed into the spare parts bin, which, by the way, is a mercy because they belong in the trash can. The workable track links from Trumpeter are a fantastic choice for anyone who's looking to opt into a workable track link offering. And what's nice about them is that they do offer the original Chevron pattern of tracks, which is more of a niche item because generally these type of tracks are found on earlier versions of the M1 and I believe even the M1A1. The Trumpeter tracks go together very well, however one small enhancement that can be made by the builder to improve their experience with working with these sets involve enlarging the holes found on the end connectors as well as the side plates. The components do have their holes molded in, however I noticed that the tolerances on these parts are so tight that when you're assembling them just raw out of the box, you run the risk of potentially damaging the track link when trying to squeeze all these pieces together. To avoid this, with a 
pin vise and a really small Dremel bit, I was able to enlarge the holes on these two components where the material removed was just enough where the parts were able to slide into place without causing any further problems. This procedure here is best done with a pin vise and honestly a pin vise is not only essential but is mandatory for this procedure. If you try the same technique with a Dremel, you run the risk of enlarging the holes too much due to the Dremel spinning at even at its lowest speed, will be too fast, it will melt the plastic around the bit, thus enlarging the hole and possibly destroying the entire component. With the pin vise, that type of a risk is greatly reduced if not eliminated. The next thing I want to mention with the tracks of course is the paintwork. Just like with the other American tanks that you've seen on this channel, the tracks are painted much along the same ways. Generally, it's no different than the Patton or the M60. The outer pads that we have here are molded in rubber on the real vehicle, as are the inner portions that the wheels actually roll on. The tooth, the skeletal structure, as well as the end connectors are all, of course, made from steel. On the model here, just like I frequently mention, the rubber components are painted with black and then weathered appropriately to replicate the look of worn rubber. And the metal components are painted with a rusty type material. The tracks, if you've ever seen on a real vehicle with a similar setup, tend to have this type of a look in real life and it's one that's not uncommon. By painting tracks in this format, this is another way to further enhance the model by giving it some more highlights and some other details which otherwise would commonly just be overpainted with a single coat of flat black or a dark gray depending on your track color of choice. From the suspension takes to the lower hull and here you can see how the bodywork was able to flare in all three of the hull components. Like I may have stated before, when the hull goes together you are going to have some seams to contend with in these two locations. One quick mod are the holes that were drilled out via the pin vise. Very simple thing to be done and one that also, again, helps look at the vehicle. Same, of course, could also be said about the tow points found on the front as well as also the bodywork that was concluded. Moving up to the taillights, you can see how the new replacement taillights look now that they're fully painted. Even though this was something that was a bit of an unexpected procedure to do, once completed, it really ended up being a happy accident because these really did help the model in the long run. Moving along takes to the top deck, and on this portion here, there's nothing really much to talk about. The Abrams is a very simplistic vehicle in this regard, and there's nothing really a whole lot going on up here. However, one thing I do want to point out is that now that the model is fully completed, you can really appreciate the engine deck detailing found on this model here. This is, like I may have mentioned before, one of the aspects of the Eshi kit that really did age remarkably well, considering the age of the kit's tooling. Really, all that I did to enhance it further was to take some diluted black paint and just add into these locations over here, which do a really good job in highlighting that molding and detailing that I was talking about. Moving our way up takes us to the turret, and the turret itself is basically built out of the box with the kit supply components. The upper and lower turret halves go together pretty well. I didn't really notice too many fitting issues on those two components. However, a little bit of bodywork was done on the areas where the upper and lowers meet, but this is basically customary on these M1 kits. On the sides here, we have the Gypsy racks. The racks on the original M1 were very different compared to the ones that would come on later versions. Notice on here, the racks end short and do not wrap around the rear bustle here of the tank. That evolution would drop, I believe, on the M1A1 upgrades compared to this older one here. On that note, you can also see the storage box is much smaller compared to the later incarnations, which they basically take up the majority of the side portion here of the turret. This configuration, by the way, is a mirror image on the opposite side, as it is on the upgraded tanks with the larger bin as well. One bit of detailing that I find interesting on this older version is with the wraparound bars that come along here, and they act as a brush guard to protect the smoke grenade launchers found on both sides. I'm a bit hazy on the later versions of the M1, but I don't believe this was something that carried over into the later upgrades. As for the pieces themselves, like we saw from the original unboxing portion, these components here did suffer some damage, and I did have to go ahead and make some repairs. Obviously, the repairs went together very well, and I was able to cobble the unit together in the manner that you see it here. The parts did go on to their appropriate locations. However, it was a little bit of a juggling act in order to have these pieces properly make contact with the side of the hull. This was something that was 
able to be done, but you do have to take your time and you have to have a lot of patience with this because you are going to be fighting with super glues in order to make sure that the piece secures to the side of the tank and it does it in a strong manner, but also does it in a way that's not overly clunky because that can hurt the look of the build. Moving our way up takes us to the smoke grenade launchers. The units themselves are the appropriate size and do have their correct geometry to them. The early, or I should say the late 70s, 80s versions of the American smoke grenade launchers had this very unique format to them. What's interesting about the Eshi kits is that they mold them with the units in their loaded configuration. The other kits on the market, namely the Tamiya kit, have these units in their empty configuration where you have the holes present. It's one interesting aspect that is found on these Eshi kits. Moving further back takes us to a jerry can. This was just the stock component was painted and then mounted to the model in the recommended location. The jerry can itself is decently rendered. Nothing really much to write home about. But it's also interesting to point out that on the later versions of the M1, this exposed jerry can here would no longer be present. Moving forward takes to the crew hatches. Starting with the cupola, all the kit supply components were utilized for this assembly here. That includes for both the cupola, the hatch, as well as the machine gun. One addition that I made to the cupola ring itself was with the little eyelet rings that we have here. These components are just fabricated out of small lengths of floor wire that were bent to shape and then mounted in their appropriate locations. This was a very simple addition to make and one that also does help the look of the build. While on that note, you can see on the M2HB, with a pin vise and a very small Dremel bit, I was able to drill out the muzzle section. Another typical mod that I make to these builds, and it's always one that really helps in the long run. One other thing I want to mention involves the ammo cans, and this is true for the version on the M240 as well as on the M2. I went ahead and painted them with a different shade of olive drab compared to the main color of the vehicle. This is a very easy way to give your build a little bit of color differentiation. The ammo cans, by the way, generally are a darker shade of olive drab, as well as even a olive green type coloring, depending on when the ammo cans were made. While on the cans, you'll see that with a very fine point paintbrush, as well as some flat yellow paint, I just added some generic little dots in these sections over here, and these give the illusion of the small fine print lettering that are generally found on these ammo cans. This is a feature I've utilized and incorporated on a few of the other builds, and it's something that I like to do because it adds a little bit of extra detailing and color pop. Hopefully with this lighting situation that I have here, you can see the reflection found on the gunner scope optic. On the kit supply piece, it's actually hollow on the inside with no other lens detailing. For this model here, in order to improve it, I took a thin piece of clear styrene and I glued it to the inside portion here of the lens. This is very easily done because the optic box itself is not integrally molded to the tank. So the way this is done is I actually painted and weathered the, the tank separately from the box, added the piece after everything was painted, and then just dropped the unit for its final installation. This is an easy way to further enhance the stock Eshi kit. Moving forward brings us to the main gun barrel. Here you can see how the barrel bodywork has been concluded. Note it's just like your average model tank build where it's just two halves glued together. There is a center seam to contend with. However, on this model here, the seam was very easily polished away with just a little bit of super glue as well as some sandpaper. I didn't notice any problems with the thicknesses of the halves and the joints lined up absolutely perfectly. On the coax machine gun, one modification I made was adding the barrel section here to the molded on tube. On the stock Eshi kit, this piece is just a solid piece of plastic with no barrel end that is present. While on the real M1, obviously you need some kind of a hole on the end for the bullets to come out of. This was a simple addition that I made with the pin vise and once added it's also a great way to help improve the look of the model as a whole. And this now leads us to the paint and the markings. For the model's paintwork, this vehicle here is painted in a single color of this green coloring. The green itself, I believe, was either to me a dark green or black green. Hard to tell. It's been a while since I've built this model. And from there, it receives my usual washes and weathering tints in order to bring it up to the condition that we see it here. The paintwork itself is heavily inspired from the box art that originally came with this model. I liked the vehicle on the box art so much that I really wanted to emulate that as much as possible. One thing I also found interesting is that when the M1s originally were fielded by the U.S. Army, they had this unique green color to them. 
the color itself was vastly different compared to the other vehicles that were being used at the time, like the Sheridan or the M60. Later on, when the vehicles would get their Merc camouflage schemes, they would blend in and use the same color palette as what was mentioned on the other vehicles. But for the ones that were just all green, like this vehicle here, this was generally the scheme that you saw them. Sliding forward brings us to the markings. The markings on this model here are the original kit supply decals, which may not sound like an achievement, but if anyone have ever watched my other SU model showcase videos, you'll know that this is actually pretty noteworthy. You see, the SE models themselves, they generally build into a pretty decent piece. However, one thing on these kits that really didn't age very well are their markings. The water slide decals, the second they hit the water, they tend to just crack up on you. And if they don't, when you try to drag them onto the surface of the vehicle, they just disintegrate into a bazillion pieces. So the decals were something that were always haphazard on these SE kits. This model here, for one reason or another, I guess the plan is all lined up perfectly. That just wasn't the case. They went on without any problems, and I'm really happy for that because the decals are really one of the more unique aspects of this kit. If I'm not mistaken, I believe this particular vehicle here, Lazen Blaze, was the winner of that competition. All of the American M1 Abrams that took part during that competition, they all had these cat motifs painted on their turrets in honor of the competition's name. There were a few other ones. The other one that was very noteworthy was, I also believe, a winner. And that one had a, a Red Cat cartoon painted right here on this side of the turret. On top of Lays and Blaze, the other markings consist of a number of Canadian flags, which will probably confuse some people if they were seeing this video for the first time. But this was done as a way to pay tribute to the fact that the competition was taking place in Canada. Outside of the Canadian markings, the vehicle consists of the standard U.S markings which would be found here on the front and the other TO and E markings are found right here on the back. It also consists of several stripes. There's a black star found right here on top of the engine grating but it's hard to see because of the exhaust so that gets added for the weathering and then there's also a weight indicator right here on the front. All the decals like I said went on without any problems. Now to secure them to this vehicle this was actually the first model that I used the VMS varnish sealant and this material is just absolutely phenomenal. I, I love it. I've stated this in a few other videos. People probably think I'm shilling for them but that's just not the case. I am just that impressed with the varnish at hand and it just leads for a better represented model overall. Again this material is highly recommended and like I stated in other videos I have been using this for a while now and I'm just thrilled with the results. One other thing that I find to be very fascinating about the M1 itself is that right now this vehicle is actually a very old design. As advanced as this tank is and as powerful as it is, the vehicle itself is about 40 something years old at this point. The tank, however, it to our modern eye seems to be, you know, standard and, you know, we've seen it basically forever now, but you have to understand when this vehicle first came out, it was radically different compared to the other vehicles of the period. To put things in perspective, here I have an M60A1, which at the time was the mainstay of the US Armored Corps, and you can see just how much radically different the Abrams is in comparison. The M1, first and foremost, the construction techniques are completely different. The 60 utilized tried and true techniques really carried over from World War II, namely cast steel components for the turret as well as the hull, while the Abrams went with the Chobham armor approach and because of that the castings were basically gone and the tank was assembled primarily from flat plates. The suspension was also radically different compared to the 60s. The 60s suspension at its heart is nothing more than the M26 Pershing's design but just evolved and carried over throughout the various decades. On the M1, the suspension was completely a new design. The only thing that was arguably similar to the 60s was the design of the track and the sprocket. Other than that, the vehicles themselves were very different from one another. Oh, and by the way, the tracks and the running gear are not interchangeable between these two vehicles. Outside of the electronics and crew survivability, another aspect of the vehicles which made them completely different were the power packs. The 60 utilized a V12 turbo diesel engine, while the Abrams went with a gas turbine jet engine. 
The Gen Engine is something that's a bit of a controversy these days because the whole point of the Gen Engine was that this they need to get this vehicle from one defensive point to another defensive point in a very short time frame. So you need a lot of power to do that. The tank itself was able to reach blistering high speeds. In fact, that the older tanks can actually go faster than the newer incarnations. This has to do with the later tanks having thicker armor, but also the later tanks have a governor chip inside them that restrict the speed of the tank. This was done in order to prevent wear and tear on the suspension because if you drive this tank at those high speeds, you're going to be burning through your tracks in a faster manner. The jet engines also are a bit more thirsty compared to the standard diesel engine, and they are more complicated. They are more susceptible to fine particulate that can damage the turbo fan blades. All of these concerns are not really present on the M60 because again, it's just your standard Greyhound bus turbo diesel engine. However, it's still very interesting to see the two vehicles paired side by side, and you really get to appreciate the design change on the Abrams when it's compared to its older counterpart. And I guess that now segues us into skill level and recommendation. Because this vehicle here is a vintage model kit, you are going to have some hand fitting that is going to be required in order to get the model together. With the combination of the hand fitting as well as with the individual Lincoln Line tracks, I can't recommend this kit to a beginner. This model here is really best left for someone who is an intermediate to an advanced range builder. If you already have a number of kits on your belt and have a good grasp on features and procedures like hand fitting as well as bodywork and seam removal, then one of these kits here would be a good way to level up. These models here, however, are not nearly as prolific as they were a number of years ago. These kits are starting to become on the rarer end, however, they are still found for relatively affordable prices. However, you're not exactly going to track these out as easily as you would with some of the other M1s on the market, say kits from Tamiya, Dragon, Trumpeter, just to name a few. In some areas, these kits are beginning to show their age. However, to Eshi's credit, they did do, in my opinion, a fantastic job with rendering the vehicle out, specifically on account that this vehicle is pushing about 40 years old now. Oddly enough, this kit here is as old as some real M1s that are still in service today. For the longest time, this kit along with the Tamiya M1 Abrams were really the only two options out there for a standard original pattern M1. However, it is important to note that within the last number of years, a new company popped up named Panda, and this company has an M1P, which is basically the version that we have here. This kit is a modern super kit with all the modern amenities that we all come to know and expect from current release kits. That kit there will build into a very nice rendition of a vehicle very similar to this. And unlike this vehicle, that model is much more easily come by. However, the price may be a little bit steeper compared to one of these older Eshi releases here. It would be interesting to pick one of those kits up and see how they compare to the older one here. However, that's really something best left for another video at another time. One advantage that this kit does have is that you can further enhance it from its stock original offering due to the amount of aftermarket detail parts that are out there. Because this is an M1 Abrams, there are a lot of detail parts floating around from gun barrels to replacement tracks to as well as other smaller fittings. Obviously on this model here, the tracks were the number one bit of equipment that I strongly recommend. In fact, I'll even go out and say that the tracks are mandatory on any of these Eshi builds, but this M1 specifically. Outside of the tracks, the remainder of the details are just really minor that can be added to this build in order to enhance it. Things like antenna bases, probably new tow cables, small stuff like that is, is really all that's required to make the model shine even more than it originally does. Which, by the way, is a testament to the quality that Eshi designed into their kits all the way back in the 80s. Moving our way to recommendations, obviously if you are a fan of the M1 Abrams tank family, this kit here is going to be strongly recommended for you. Like I stated before, this is really the beginning of the family tree for the M1, and if you have the M1A1, M1A2, and all the other different alphabet versions of those vehicles in your collection, this particular build here would be greatly appreciated, if not really mandatory. Along similar lines, if you're a fan of U.S. military vehicles, as well as Cold War era military vehicles, this kit here would easily fit into that collection as well.
Because the vehicle is 135th scale, obviously if you are a fan of dioramas, this kit here would also be an interesting choice for you. With the subject matter and the era that this vehicle represents, you can have this vehicle paired with any other US military vehicle from the late 1970s and the early 1980s time frame. Vehicles like the Mutt, the M113, the Bradley, as well as of course the M60A1. Another individual who I'd recommend this kit to is a bit of a niche type of a person, but they are out there, and that would be anyone who's a fan of building and collecting vintage plastic model kits. Obviously, this kit here, being from the era as it is, ticks all of those boxes. Along similar lines, if you're the type of person who likes to build and collect eshy military vehicles, this kit here is another no-brainer. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale M1 Abrams main battle tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 135th scale model showcase videos like this guy over here or the larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been showcased on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, and I'll be catching you guys again on the next one. Later.